Recorded live. Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Many of us, when we find ourselves on our life's journey, sometimes feel this certain yearning. We try to reach out and discover how we can find that way to fulfill that seems to be empty inside of us. That happened to a guest that was joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today as she found herself into her career in a mental health field and despite achieving professional success, felt empty inside, probably like many of us had. She felt she had everything that she had been thought that would make her happy, but was feeling dissatisfied and restless, yearning for something deeper. It was at a chance encounter when she came across the book Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures by religious reformer Mary Baker Eddy, who is known to be one of the founders of what is known as Christian Science. She decided to focus her attention on her Christian Science healing practice, and today she's going to be talking about what is known as a spiritual revolution, a quest to experience God. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Julia Nessie. Julia, thank you for being on the program today. Oh, thanks, Daniel. Good to be with you. Now, when we talk about a quest for God, I think all of us, now we may have different languages for it or different ways we express this, but we really are always yearning for that meaning, you know, that answer to the, why am I here? Yeah. Is this something that happened in your adult life, or did it start much, much younger, and then you kind of put it aside because you started to, how should we say, appeal to the reason everybody else gave you for what you should be doing with your life? Well, that's a great question. Um, Actually, you know, I think from the time I was a a young girl, I always had this sense that there was something more to life than just what I saw with my, you know, with my eyes or that, you know, I could, that we could kind of see around us and feel and experience that there was something deeper. But it was um, probably, I think I must have been in my 20s, actually, when I had gotten, as you've described in the opening, I had achieved all these things that um, others had told me, you know, the checklist that many of us carry around. um, And I had fulfilled all of that but still felt that inner longing. So I think it was something that was always there from the time I was a young girl but really kind of came fully out probably in my, my uh, mid to late 20s. Um, and that's what kind of impelled me on a spiritual search, much like people are doing today. I meet folks all the time that are yearning after, as you described so beautifully in your opening remarks, something more than what we you know, experience with the physical senses. You know, I'm reminded when I was reading some of your story here about, um, I think it was in a, Hindu scripture, not necessarily a scripture, but I came across what they called Lila, L-I-L-A. And the simple interpretation is that it's the idea that God likes to play hide-and-go-seek. In other words, <laughs> you know, he seems to hide from you, or she, and at the same time is always right there and present. But we always tend to think that we need to reach outside to find that thing that we're looking for. Did you find at one point in your search all of a sudden that sort of aha moment where you thought, I couldn't believe it was right there in front of me? (laughs) (laughs) You know, um, I did have a very profound aha moment. Um, After looking into a lot of different practices, you know, spiritual practices over a period of years, doing different things at different times, and um, just kept moving. what, What happened was nothing really was a permanent kind of answer for me until I picked up the book Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. And I found in that book, that was my aha moment as I started reading it. Um, Mary Baker Eddy, the author, it was like I found this experience of, I had an experience of like this sacred space with her, that she understood me. She was writing about what was happening inside me and what I was looking for. And as I started reading the book, I had this incredible, incredible feeling of having come home. It's like, this is it. Just like you said, it's like, oh my gosh, here it is. This is what I've been looking for. And that just kind of put me on a a path that um, was pretty, talk about revolutionary. It was pretty revolutionary to my life because as you um, offered in the beginning, I I had a pretty traditional 
mental health practice at the time, and things began to change. Now, you actually left a uh, fairly successful psychotherapy practice uh, when this transformation was occurring. What gave you the courage to kind of put that behind? Because we find, and I'm sure you had this experience, you know a lot of people that have this experience, is that we have the known, the thing that makes us feel comfortable, the thing that we can count on, that security, that thing that seems to be hardwired in us that says, you know, being sedentary is okay if everything is kind of all in order, but life has a funny way of saying, well, deep inside your thinking as you're sitting there and you're feeling that you're very content, you're also saying to yourself that you want more, that you wished you had this, and life starts listening to that. You might even say God listens to that, if you will, and certainly gives it to you. And one thing we don't like is change mm-hmm. if we're not the ones initiating it. Mm-hmm. Well, even when we are the ones initiating it, sometimes <laughs> we don't <laughs> like it. You know, there's this great, um, you may be familiar with Andrew Guide, the French author and Nobel Prize winner. He says, one does not discover new lands without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a very long time. And I think I got to the point where I was willing to lose sight of the shore of what was comfortable, of what was known, because the yearning after something greater, bigger, deeper, wider, higher, holier was overwhelming any sense of of staying in my comfort zone. And it actually became an uncomfortable zone because of what I was learning. But Christian Science and Science and Health, um, Mary Baker Eddy explained so clearly in that book, it gives us a new way to think. It's transformative and revolutionary in how we think. So my thinking was changing. It was changing about my identity in particular, my purpose, my my understanding of God, supreme being, deity, however you want to use, whatever words you want to use for that power greater than ourselves. And it was becoming more uncomfortable to stay tight in the bud you know, as the expression goes, I had to, I I had to push out to the new lands and lose sight of the shore. And I was willing to do that. And I think that, you know, we have to, there's, I think, a a courage that we have to and a strength that we have to draw from with deep within us, impelling us in that direction and be ready. You know, um, Christian science is is biblically based. It's, you know, based on Jesus' life and teachings and you know, I could. I, I what comes to mind is when um, uh, Jesus called to. His, Jesus was walking on the water, which was pretty remarkable. And Peter wanted to do the same, and he stepped out of the boat. He he got out of his comfort zone, and of course, eventually he sank, but he was saved. Um, but he was willing to step out of his comfort zone, you know, to go to something greater, the pull, the draw to that Christliness, to that spiritual nature, to understanding something greater was, was more and just overcame the fear, overcame the, the, you know, the tendency to, sometimes the human mind, the tendency is to kind of stay where we are, stuck, you know, rather than push out. So that was, that was what was for me. I was willing to lose sight of the shore. And the rewards are grand when we do that. It's not an easy road, and it wasn't an easy road for me, and I I would never um, offer to anyone that it's going to be, you know, no one ever promised us a rose garden, as the expression goes. But um, it was deeply challenging to me, but I think what I've learned after many decades (laughs) is that that which comes, you know, um, when we struggle with things, when we push ourselves, that's when we have the, the depth of experience and meaning in our lives that we so very want. You know, just recently I was uh, doing a, a show on the lost art of love, and it was really a remarkable talk in the, in the idea that when we first talk about love, we always talk about love and love relationships, uh, you know, falling in love with a partner, things like that. But this was one uh, that I we started elevating the talk to where you realize, okay, well, relationships are pretty important as we are people of connection. You know, that's what humans are. And the fact is we started elevating the talk to a point where we were getting to what would be called spiritual love. In other words, it's the soul transcending beyond that. 
mm-hmm. and you know giving examples for instance <coughs> excuse me uh, uh people who might have children with severe disabilities how do they get up every day and face this child in this world and say you know you deserve to have the best life you can and then you see as an outsider this going on where these parents are taking care of this child unconditional love it seems mm. and there's a lot of happiness going on there and that's what he was talking about in this talk too was well love gets to a point that you're transcending all that to a mm-hmm. point that you you it overflows with you and you reach out in service and he says that's when you're uh, experiencing love to such a magnitude that the outcome is continued sustainable happiness, mm-hmm. even in light of what's happening. And so let's take a look at, for instance, Jesus Christ and his story. You know, most of the time that he's talked about in church, they seem to focus on his sacrifice, him being on the cross, and then the resurrection. Now, I started getting to a point in my own life where I was like, you said Christian, and I was going to run the other way. Because yeah. there seemed to be a lot of judgment, you know, from people who were Christians. You know, well, you're not going to get into the kingdom of heaven. You know, I'm thinking, well, who are you? Now, I came through the back door probably about six years ago, five years, give or take, where I picked up a book that was called something like Simple Abundance. And I just flipped to a particular month, and I think it was in July, where I came across her suggesting this book. And I can't remember the name of the guy right now, but I thought, okay, I'm going to check this out. And it was through that that I started getting into the works of Barry Baker Eddy and Christian Science. And I thought, wait a minute, how come they're not talking about this in this way? Because people would actually be inspired. Yeah. <laughs> you see, yeah. Much as you were. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think what you're talking about with, just to circle back this idea of um, a spiritual love, um, it's, it, it gets to a place of, um, I think, connecting with the divine, you know, to see the source of that love, not as personal, like, I didn't create it, you didn't create it, you know, but that it is um, the ultimate kind of center and circumference. Mary Baker Eddy writes in her book, you know, that God, you could say love, is at once the center and circumference of being. It's like a fount of love. And when we connect with that source of love, it transcends to my experience, and I've been healed of countless physical issues, emotional problems, I mean, you name it, because getting a bigger, grander sense of what love is, the, the, the all-presence of that love, the all-power of that love, that's bigger and greater than anything we're faced with. And so right in the midst of struggles, right in the midst of what would seem on the outside to be hardships, I mean, I think that's what... Jesus' life showed us that no matter what it is, that love that is, as we can say, defined as God, that love that is the Almighty, that love that is all good, is more powerful than anything that we have to confront. And when we connect with that love, when we let that inspire us, when we let that animate us, when we let that heal us, when they, we let that restore us, regenerate us, you know, uplift us, strengthen us, um, heal us in any way, it's the deepest and greatest satisfaction we're ever going to have and meaning in this, on this earth, in this walk. I really believe that, Daniel. I mean, that's been my experience over and over. And the more I'm at this and growing spiritually myself, helping others both as a practitioner with a practice, teaching, going around, and I, I lecture and speaking to, to the audiences, that that's where we find our greatest and deepest satisfaction, permanent, transcending whatever it is that, you know, is in front of us. Um, it's just, a, it, 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 and to me that's the, the, the beauty of what Christian science has done for me. It's given me a grander view of God's presence, of love's presence and power that's always there to help us, to heal us, change how we think about ourselves and then how we live our lives. It's, it's blessing and, and it's for everyone. You know, and the beauty of what you're saying there, uh, Julie, is this, is the idea that change is one of those things that if you have all of this in you as you're describing, it's something you reach out and you yearn for, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, because, you know, um, 
kind of a, a fundamental stone, if you will, um, in the teachings of Christian science is uh, right in the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis, that we are made in God's image and likeness. And so it is a, it is a constant growing in understanding what that means. And, and what that, how that impacts our lives. So everything we have is already within because of who and what we are and who and what gives us and sustains our life and that we can never get outside the orbit of love's infinitude. Even if we try, we can't do it. And it's, it's an awakening, Daniel, that goes on. It's an awakening that's happening. It's not that we're, we're taking something from the outside and putting it within us. It's an awakening from what's already, it's a spiritual discovery of already what's all within us. And it ultimately heals, you know, and it happens step by step as we grow. You know, it's not like one fell swoop. We do have moments. I've had moments of just really intense and incredible um, of, 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 of uh, inspiration and awakening. But you know, it's more to me kind of it's the day in and day out striving to live what it means to be the image of love, that we're not a bundle of material elements, even though that's what it looks like. We're really spiritual. We are innately and inherently spiritual beings right here and right now. And as we live that more, as we understand and live that more and more, it absolutely transforms. It's revolutionary. That's why... I titled this uh, th- th- this discussion a spiritual revolution. Now I'm curious because it's it's funny when you hear or see or experience this from other people um, when a tremendous adversity hits them and they turn away from that and they they feel they can no longer believe why would this happen why would a perfect God make this happen. Now, in your experience, for instance, uh, how would you say that you, if you have transcended that attitude or that way of looking at things, that if something was to come into your life that would be why me sort of a situation, what what would you say to that? That would be, what was that word you used? Transcend. No, but why me? That would be coming, that would be why me? That would be... Oh, it was uh, why me? Oh, you know how me. people Sorry, get that. It's okay. almost why they they me. take yeah. that position in tremendous adversity. Yeah. They become a right. victim, if you will. How would you say you are now versus, let's say, five years ago, uh, if something like that should happen? What would you say to people that may be experiencing something like that now, yeah. or you know, kind of give us uh, some enlightenment on that? Well, I think you know, for me my understanding is that all roads, all roads lead back to our understanding of what God is. I don't believe God uses, sends, um, in any way causes us to have hardships. So I think that's the first thing is um, I've grown in my understanding of what deity is and is not. And so that, was the, that would be the first thing I would say is that perhaps um, this is an opportunity to learn more about God and the nature of God. So that would be the first thing. And I think the more I've come to understand that um, and let go of the childhood God I was taught, I wasn't um, brought up in this um, practice and these teachings in Christian science, this denomination, um, and I had a very different view of deity and might have thought at one time that when hardships came that it was, you know, God was allowing it to happen or causing it to happen. But now I see it more as an opportunity. I see the, the struggle. And believe me, I have had, <laughs> I've had my share of struggles and continue to. Um, I could give you a laundry list. I'm sure folks listening wouldn't be interested in it. But I, I certainly have had um, many things happen in my life. And just a, one sh- small example is that, you know, my mother um, – had a diagnosis many years ago of early onset Alzheimer with Alzheimer's when she was in her 60s. My father became very ill at the same time, and for 12 years I took care of both of them. Um, that was a very, very deeply challenging time. Um, 
And so um, what I started to do, though, was see the struggles, see the hardships, I'll put those in, that in quotes, as opportunities to learn more about how loved I was by my creator and where my strength came from and where um, and, and, and how this could help me to grow more in understanding that I was the very likeness of spirit. And so that's what I would say. But one is to have a, you know, maybe take a step back and pause and think maybe there's a different way to think about our creator, our maker, than one has been taught or thinks about currently. And then second, see, well, perhaps this is an opportunity for me to, to deepen my spiritual practice, to, to go deep within myself and experiencing, experience more of the infinite love that's ever present and ever at hand to help and heal us and bless us. And there's a blessing in this. And that's why I talked about earlier uh, about that show that we did about love. And in fact, the uh, guest that I had actually had a son who was born with Down syndrome. Uh And he was talking about that very struggle himself, about how, you know, he went through these different stages and then finally got to a point where he realized, you know, I'm experiencing the world in a much different way than I ever would have had this never happened. Yeah. You see, and that's what you talk about because, again, I think sometimes people may find a religious way or that, that awakening, if you will, and they think, this should make my life easier. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true, it does, but it still takes a heck of a lot of work. <laughs> it takes, it, you're right. It takes, and I think that's where we have to kind of give our consent that, you know, we are – that that we are willing to do the work. It's worth it. I guess that's what I would want to get out <laughs> to the world. It is so worth it. It is so worth it, you know. I mean, I've seen first in my mental health practice and now as a practitioner of Christian science, I mean, over and over and over, you know, I get calls from people. I have visits with folks who are really yearning for something more, something deeper. They want to hit the pause button. I, I'm here in the Northeast, and we live at a very rapid pace. <laughs> and, you know, we've got kids who are booked from morning till night and parents that are charging all over the towns and stuff. And, you know, I hear all the time, gosh, I just want to have some time to just be, to think, to pause. You know, it's like um, there's got to be something better than this than what I'm doing, you know. And um, I think our spiritual practice and our spiritual lives gives us that. But we've got to work at it, like you said. It takes work. It takes commitment. It takes conviction. You know, and again, not to scare people off. You can do it. it to me, it, it's kind of something that grows within us. And you, it, it, it's like when you're a child and you're learning, you know, math. You start with the, the very simple you know, addition and subtraction, and then you advance and you advance and you advance. I think of like I think that it's similar in our spiritual growth. So someone can just start it's a very very simple um, practice, and to, but just the important thing is to get on the path. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, get started. Mm-hmm. Get started. It's now, so I'm curious as you're out doing uh, you, you, uh, speaking and, and engagements, things like that. What would you say is the average age of your audience? Oh, that's a good question. And you know, the reason I ask that is because we live in a society today so chocked full of technology. It seems that now people are born with cell phones in their hands. <laughs> and it's yeah. just a strange paradox to think. They're on that phone looking to see if anybody has connected with them and who they can connect to. Mm -hmm. You know, they're caught up in social networking, and yet people are surrounding each other with live presence, but they're not interested in that. (laughs) You know, and that's why I asked that question about your audience and what that's like. Well, I think um, that's a great question, and I think that connection, though, is key. We all want to be connected. You know, you know, you know, remember that song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places? Right. You know, it's like looking for connection in all the wrong places. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, and I stay connected. I'm on social media, et cetera, et cetera. But there's got to be a right sense of balance about that, you know. Um, and I think sometimes we have a tendency, 
and some go to quite the extreme um, and, and lose the, 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 what I would say the, the, the right kind of connection. But um, the audience, just to answer your question, I think it depends on the setting because I've had some audiences, and I'm going to be actually speaking at a college. Um, again, I was, I was um, actually at the University of Arkansas, and I had all college students for like hours and hours and hours that I wow. spoke with. Yeah, and I'm going to be speaking at another college um, uh, next month. And, um, but then also um, I have had audiences when it's the general public. Um, I've had um, folks that are probably, you know, um, midlife and beyond, um, whatever that means, I guess, right? But then also, um, interestingly... means we're I, beyond reason. We don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, into the wind. I've been doing things for years the way everybody yeah, said right, I should right. be, and I've had enough. Yeah, enough. Basta, as they say in Italian. Basta, my father used to use that term. Um, you know, um, but I've also spoken, I've had the opportunity, which I'm very grateful for over the years, to speak to healthcare professionals because of my background, having come out of a very traditional um, medical setting or a healthcare setting. Um, I've had the opportunity to speak to physicians and nurses and social workers and other kinds of therapists um, and um, was up, you know, speaking to a group of psychiatric residents who were, you know, late 20s, getting ready to launch their psychiatric career, you know, in a, in a classroom with them. So, you know, it's been quite a, quite a, a variety of folks in terms of who I, who I speak with. Now, because you left your psychotherapy practice, it seems that you're also, as you say, you're speaking more to healthcare professionals. So that, seem, that was your calling, I would, I would think, was, you know, a way of healing people, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that... From, as I mentioned when we started our conversation, from the time I was a little girl, I always had this desire to be of help to others. Mm -hmm. And it just evolved from when I was like in first and second grade doing it certain ways through grade school and high school and college and graduate school and then professionally. So it's been an evolution for me as I've grown. And I think this is the way life works. As we grow and as our thinking shifts and how you know, the, the, the external circumstances will change. You know, as the in, as the inner world changes, so does our outer world. And that's so key that you said that at this particular moment uh, of of the show is because there's so much. Well, there's total truth in that, and it is a fact that as you do change your inner world, the change starts inside of you. Yeah. And as you do that, you will shift the outside world. It's a weird phenomenon that even science through quantum physics has mm -hmm. proved. Now, if we got that going for us, if people want to take a look at a science approach, people would say, well, for instance, well, I wished or wanted or desired this. How come I got this outcome? Well, pay attention to your thinking is the first thing I would say and say, what is the conversation going on in your head when you say, for instance, I would like to become wealthy, okay? <laughs> yeah. A lot of people seem to have that desire, and I think it's because truly the desire is they believe wealth will wipe away most of their adversity. The fact is taking care of more money is a lot more responsibility, and it will bring you adversity you weren't even used to before. <laughs> I wouldn't know. It's never been a problem. <laughs> I've never quite had to deal with that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, it's so true, though, and, and, and in fact, I remember uh, – reading in the works of uh, Richard Bandler, who's known as the uh, founder of um, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, he says the very same thing. Pay attention to your thinking. What is it actually saying? So when you may have a desire, you say, I'd like to have this, your subconscious, if you can catch it, which you can if you start practicing this, will say something probably different like, well, you don't deserve that, or what makes you think you're so worthy? See, that's that deeper message that you need to listen to. So when you hear about people saying, hear the word of God, would that be an accurate way of kind of looking at that? Well, um, I think that I'm gonna, just going to throw out some, an idea that I'd like to think to start the conversation about this with, which is um, one of the ways um, that uh, Mary Baker Eddy, um, she, and she pulled it from the Bible, you know, it's biblically based, um, has presented to, to us all, to the world, is understanding God as divine mind, capital M. And so, 
you know, um, very. I, I think it's just um, so much of what I do in my practice, and I know others do, and is striving to connect with that mind that is God, that's all good. And it's not about what I want. <laughs> it's not about, you know, what I think I should have or I deserve to have or I don't deserve to have, but rather it's a striving, not my will, but thine be done as Jesus prayed, a striving to connect with that one divine mind as the source of our thinking and living. And when we do that, we will find a sense of peace and harmony and, you know, um, abundance and reception of all that, we're, that we um, are longing for. But I think it's really important to recognize that idea. Um, from a Christian science perspective, we are talking about their being. That's where Eddie got to in all the years of, um, of, of um seeking and, and, and testing and searching and proving in her own life and praying that there is just, and that one divine mind is the ultimate healer. And so our work is really to connect with that, to yield to what mind, capital M, is communicating to us. Now, how would you, in your own words, best describe the experience of what that is? Um, what that is? You mean connecting with mind? no divine mind. Divine mind. It's a, I an all knowing, all good consciousness that is God. I mean, that's how I think of what mind is, um, and what God is, and <clears throat> so um, for me. When I, it, for example, um, when I was uh, first studying Christian science, I was taking medication. I was being treated by an endocrinologist for a thyroid issue, and I was taking daily medication, and she had said, you're going to need to take this medication for the rest of your life. You know, your thyroid will become inactive, et cetera. But the more that I studied the teachings of Christian science and dug into the Bible and science and health and looked and understood more and more of Mary Baker Eddy's life, um, I started to feel like I should be able to be free of this. I should be able to be free of this medication. If everything I'm studying and hearing and reading here is true, I should be able to be free of this. And so ultimately, to make a long story short, um, I stopped taking the medication and turned to a Christian science practitioner, a healer, for help with this issue. And what happened as she was praying for me and I was praying for myself, I think to just to get back to your question about mind, it was I just let that mind, as Jesus said, let that mind, or uh, uh, Paul, sorry, be in you which was in Christ Jesus. It was like I let the light in mentally, and I had this moment of clear illumination of seeing differently, um, mentally seeing differently. And I recognized myself in a, in a new way as wholly spiritual. I got a little bit of an understanding of insight into what that means to be spiritual, to be the child of God. That that, and I believe it was connecting with divine mind in prayer that brought that illumination, and Daniel, I was healed. I haven't taken thyroid medication in decades. I haven't needed to. Now, would you say that what you, uh, I suppose, experienced would be considered a miracle? If so, how would you describe what a miracle is? Well, um, a miracle... Um, Actually, in, um, it's divinely natural. What happened to me is divinely natural. So that's what I would, it's not miraculous in the sense of, oh my gosh, this was out of the ordinary, but rather a divinely natural occurrence that came from understanding 
who, uh, just a glimpse, a, a clear glimpse as to who I really am and what God is and understanding that relationship just a, with a little bit more. There's a great definition in the glossary. There's one um, chapter in the back of Science and Health and Glossary where Mary Baker Eddy defines terms from a spiritual perspective. And when she defines miracle, she says, that which is divinely natural but must be learned humanly. So we, you, we learn it in, through our experience, but it's a divinely natural occurrence. Because you hear about this, you read about this, and people think, well, mm -hmm. how come it's not happening for me should they happen to be at that darkest hour in their own lives? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that right now, individually and collectively, we have a lot to learn about spiritual reality and the present, the present, and its presence here. I mean, and so there's more for us to learn. There's always more for us to learn. There's always more for us to grow into. And sometimes we have to grow into the answer to our prayers. And there's further to go, a deepening that's needed. And sometimes the reformation, you know, what I have found too, Daniel, that's so required, and I think this is where the work comes in, use biblical terms, you know, to put off the old man or old woman, to put on the new, to be willing to be regenerated, to lose those um, characteristics, if you will, ways of thinking and living and being that are not in line with our, the divinity of our nature, our Christly divine nature that Jesus showed us. And so sometimes there's greater um, work that needs to be done in that area. I know, for instance, for myself, um, I'll be honest, I mean, I, I came to these teachings with a bit of a, an edgy, sarcastic way of relating to people. I had to lose that. That had to go. That was no part of how God made me, created me, maintains me. And um, it didn't go so easily, necessarily, but I'm grateful to say that there's just tiny little remnants of it that pop up every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> that surprise the people who have... Part of that old cellular memory is still hanging on, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, just a little bit there. You know, but that kind of thing, there's a regeneration that's needed, a reformation that's needed to, do, to live the divinity of our nature because that's what we are. And that's why this science is practical and it's provable that we are the children of God made in our creator's image and likeness, but we have to prove it, Daniel. We have to go out there and live it. We have to be it, in a sense. And so sometimes, you know, that takes a bit of a mighty struggle. You know, maybe, you and, know. Yeah, and Julia, you're hitting on, I think, a very key thing that I think our listeners should pay attention to when you say you have to go out and live it. Okay. Yes. And what I mean by that is this, getting back to when I was asking you about what does your typical audience look like and bringing up the idea of technology and social media, we tend to go out there believing, uh, let's say, in this situation, somebody awakens, okay, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to be the living embodiment of what uh, this is all about. Let's say, Julia, that you're one of those kind of people. But you might go out there and what you'll end up doing, at least in the beginning until perhaps you become aware of this, is that you will actually go out and support your biases. You'll surround yourself with people that affirm that you're this, you know, this neat person, oh, we like your change and that sort of a thing. But you really won't get out there and challenge yourself by being around people and in situations that, quite frankly, you get up and think, I can't stand this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you were talking. I, I know you mentioned the word courage earlier. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people have an idea of courage as that, you know, defiant warrior we see in the movie facing the beast, which probably isn't too far from the truth. So we muster that kind of courage when we realize true courage is continuing each step in a day, in a moment, in a, in a second, in, in a time in your life that you simply just can't stand. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And realizing that it's impermanent, that it isn't going to last, and you realize when you start, at least for me, I know I had this experience many years ago, and I still have it today, is that let's say you have this adversity. It could be like in 2008, everybody was losing everything. And that moment for a lot of those people must have felt like a lifetime. 
but when is this ever going to end? But when it does, you can look back and realize that didn't last as long as I thought it did. Mm -hmm. You see, there's the difference there, especially when it comes to courage. The courage mm -hmm. to get up each day and face that. Yep. Well, I think it, it takes a lot of courage to do that for sure. And I think it takes a lot of courage to face within ourselves those aspects, those characteristics that are not particularly admirable. To be willing to acknowledge that, to be vulnerable, to, to, to be vulnerable to God by acknowledging that and being willing to let them be reformed, that reform. But it does take courage to do that. You know, there's this great um, uh, text from um, the Bible that says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but let God remake you so that your whole attitude of mind is changed. It's like um, letting ourselves be remolded and remade. That takes courage. That takes courage and to be willing to, as you said, to get up day in and day out and to be in situations, um, in circumstances that um, are not that easy to do. You know, um, one of the things I had um, an opportunity to do some years ago, I had um, a talk on the healing power of forgiveness. And that was just an incredible experience to travel around the country and speak to groups about the healing power of forgiveness. And talk about courage, <laughs> you know, um, and having to draw it from deep within ourselves um, to forgive ourselves, to forgive others. That takes, and, and to be in situations um, where you might prefer to run fast in the other direction. Um, it takes a lot of courage. Now, I'm not suggesting anyone stay in a situation, and I never did, that was, you know, toxic or dangerous or anything for them. But to, at times, having to confront, you know, really difficult things takes a lot of strength and moral courage. Well, and here's, a, I would guess, a pretty good practice for pretty much anybody listening. Uh, most of us go to jobs. Not all of us are entrepreneurs and building our own businesses, but that certainly is a wonderful track that you should get on because you would experience a way of yourself you didn't even know existed. <laughs> Believe me. But you could do this today. Think of people that you may work with. It could be your boss, which is usually where the finger gets pointed in that, God, I despise my boss. <laughs> but think, how could I change the nature of how I experience these mm -hmm. people that don't make me feel so good or that I don't think about in a very positive way? I mean, it's all right there in front of you. It's amazing how it the lessons are always right there around you. The more you're willing to reach out and say, you know, I, I love this lesson is in front of me, and it could be a difficult coworker, it could be a boyfriend, a girlfriend, your children. It's all around you, the opportunities. You talk about abundance when people think that they're in lack. Uh, we're full of abundance. You just have to change the way you see the nature of that word. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It, and you're right. You're right. I mean, I think that our day-to-day -day life, our day-to-day -day walk gives us countless opportunities to um, practice what you and I have been discussing and to have a vibrant, active spiritual practice that pushes us forward individually and collectively. And ultimately, Daniel, that's what's needed to save our world. <laughs> yes, it's us saving you know, ourselves first in that well, unique way. Just, mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. Yeah, there's so much needed. And, you know, to me, ultimately, ultimately, it's about love with a capital L. And not to be, and you, you had that wonderful program that you talked about, getting to that place of spiritual love. I think, just imagine, you think of John Lennon, imagine a world, though, where all of us were really striving to live that love, you know, day in and day out, situation by situation. And we all have the ability to do that in, in small ways and bigger ways, but we do, no one is um, without that opportunity. And as I've said a number of times since we've been chatting is that the rewards, the blessings are grand and so worth it, 
so, so worth it. And you can tell, I would think, from our conversation, too, that when you can come to that place, that you can see sustainable happiness in anything that happens. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean you're not going to get frustrated or pissed off if right. you want to use that right. term, you know, as a technical term there. Even Anthony <laughs> Robbins, he says, with the level of what I do and the work yeah. that I help people transform, he says, believe me, there are times that I get aggravated, I get upset, I feel of depressed, course. I feel all these things, but yep. you, you, you come to that place where you now realize the empowered thing you have inside that says, but you have a choice of how long you stay there. Yes, and he sir. says, that's the difference there. Well, and um, you absolutely, we always have a choice. We always have a choice in how the question is not, that, it's not that those things aren't going to come to any, all of us. They do, as he said, they do. They come to all of us. It's um, how long we stay there, but how we, how we choose to deal with it. I mean, that's really the um, kind of, to me, the line of demarcations. Okay, so how are you going to think about this? How long are you going to stay here? And what are you going to do about it? Not that these aren't going to come. They do. Challenges come. It's the nature of our walk on this earth right now. Now, I would say, too, though, let's say I'm going to, I want to use you as an example, because you do go out and you talk with a lot of uh, uh, people uh, around the United States and perhaps you're even stretching out beyond these borders into the world, that you're feeling this light and experiencing this light within you coming on, turning on. And it's, uh, fair to say, too, that as people get to that level, they start attracting more and more people that seem to kind of want to bathe in that light rather than light their own lantern, so to speak. Have you experienced that? <laughs> um, you mean they want to kind of sap you? know, it's you? like following the guru wherever they go. As long as I'm in the guru's presence, life is yeah. going to be good, but it's like, but you're not doing anything else. <laughs> right. Yeah. But what that if, if you're having those kind of experiences now? Well, um, to tell you the truth, I think that that's a that's a um, I'll use the word danger. I think for anyone that's a spiritual um, teacher, you know, that's a spiritual that has a spiritual practice that's you know very public, um, and so um, I, I I really guard against that, and I and I work to, to not allow that to happen. And it's always a question of for me of you know turning it back to. Everyone has an individual relationship with God. You know, I can't do it for you. I don't want to do it for me. You don't want to. Do, you don't. You don't want me to do it for you. And so I, I really kind of just mentally guard against that happening um, and discourage it because I think there is there is that tendency in the human mind sometimes to want to do that. You know, and to. Um, <laughs> Take the shortcut, in other words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are no shortcuts. I've learned yeah. that lesson. But there are no shortcuts. But yeah. The shortcut is just stay on the track. <laughs> That's the shortcut. <laughs> well, yeah. listen, do you have a website where people can find out more about your work, where you might be, things like that? Sure, yeah. I'll give you two websites. My um, my own website is um, open to the number two spirituality.com, open to spirituality.com. Um, and then there's also ChristianScience.com, which is a whole lot bigger than what my site is. It has lots and lots of things that we talked about in much more, many articles and podcasts, etc. So those are two great resources. And if you know someone wanted to be able to um, to get a hold of Science and Health, um, they'd be able to do that through ChristianScience.com as well. So, um, but my my website, so it's open the number two Spirituality.com or and and or ChristianScience.com. And ultimately, as you find yourself fascinated with this, as I was, like I said, you know, you said Christian to me some years ago, and I would have ran the other direction. But I was, I guess, call it feel blessed uh, through Eastern philosophy and that sort of thing that I came, what I would call through the back door. So I got to see it and experience it differently. And then, again, as I said about five or six years ago, coming across that one book where I found this guy and I started really diving into this, I was fascinated with it. You know, the way Uh they were talking, you know, the idea of thoughts become words and words become reality sort of a thing. And I was like, these were all things that we were talking about in our show the whole time. And I was finally going, God, after all these years, I finally get it. Why couldn't have I gotten this when I was in my teens? <laughs> you were ready, that's why. There you, you go. When the student it, right? is ready, the, the, the teacher appears. There's no doubt about that. And it's been a, a lot of fun, and it's certainly been a lot of fun talking with you. And I suppose 
People could leave today thinking to themselves in any situation, they might say, well, what would Mary Baker Eddy do? <laughs> she would and turn to God. <laughs> probably say, well, I would be Julianing or I'd be Dannying. You know, that's the way I would do it. <laughs> but certainly doing it in your own unique way is the way to it. So Absolutely. Yep. And to remember that we can never get outside the orbit of love's infinitude, ever. And that's ever, just ever. an amazing thought and it's a comforting one as well. Julia, thank you so much for being on the program today. And one more time, go ahead and give out that website or those websites people can sure, find out Sure, sure. Well, and thank you. It's um, open to the number two spirituality.com and christianscience.com. Well, very good. Julia, thank you so much for being on the Beyond 50 radio Thanks program. Thanks for having me. You bet. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. One spiritual quest you can certainly take is find out more about what Beyond 50 Radio is doing. Just visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletters so you can stay up to date with the world of Beyond 50 and our upcoming shows such as the one you enjoyed today. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>